Hello, everyone. It is October 26th, 2022, and I am so ready for Halloween. Today, I'm dressed up as someone who has their stuff together and definitely hasn't overcommitted. Uh, super convincing, right? Yes. Well, it's officially fall. I have my space heater on. I switched from ice to hot coffee. I got a candle going. I am basic, and I make no apologies for it. Uh, pumpkins are everywhere. What do you want from me? Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for a very special edition of Synchro Webinars. My name is Erin Zabarak, and I'm your host for today's webinar. For those who have joined us in the past, I think I've mentioned I spend an obsessive amount of time on the socials, the social media. Uh, not just my personal pages, I am also the president of the PTA. Uh, please see my earlier comment about overcommitting. Um, I run that page as well. So I do my very best to keep up with trends and all things new on the social media. But I have two guests today who might actually spend more time than I do online. So I'm very excited to be joined by one of our social media uh, experts, Connor Westman. Connor is great. We've worked together to help a few dealers, but no offense to you, sir, I am most excited that we are joined by Meta Automotive Client Partner, Ryan Bolt. Ryan has brought some fantastic stats, some insights, plus some sneak peeks about what's coming in the metaverse. Ryan and Connor, too. Uh, thank you both for being here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Excited to be here. Awesome. Okay, so I see some people joining still, so let's go through a few logistics, and then we will jump right in. We are recording the deck today, or the webinar today, and the deck is available in the handout section of your GoToWebinar toolbar. So if you want to download that and follow along, it is there for you. As always, we do want you to ask your questions along the way. You will see that question section there in that toolbar. Tell us what you want to know. Ask some of those questions. I will say I am driving the PowerPoint today. Apologies for any whiplash going back and forth between the slides. Um, and I may be a little slower on the Q&A than normal, but I promise we should have some time at the end as well. All right, I think that's everything. Let me make sure I can go ahead to the agenda. Perfect, I got it, I can handle this. Uh, so here's what we're gonna do. I just handled those introductions. Ryan's gonna take us through today's automotive shopper, some of those key stats I mentioned proven dealership tactics so i know why you're all here tell me what to do and that's what we're going to cover and then like i said ryan's got a sneak preview of what's coming next um, on social media on meta um, we do have a facebook quarter jar so anytime we say facebook instead of meta everybody's got to put put that quarter in um, so connor my money's on you um, losing your shirt today <laughs> So, and we do have some time for Q&A at the end. So, Ryan, I think that takes us through. So, I'm going to hand it over to you and let's get started. Yeah, no, sounds good. So, again, thanks for having me here today, guys. Um, really excited to chat with you guys. And I think kind of starting off setting the stage for kind of what's happening within automotive helps us have a few conversations later on around what are some of the tactics or strategies to meet some of today's shopper. <clears throat> so, we'll briefly cover kind of change one what's changing with our customers specifically. So we'll talk through some of the demographic shifts that are happening. I think next we'll cover uh, change two. So some of the technology that's shifting. Um, it's really interesting, just this explosion of different ways in which customers are interacting and engaging online. So we'll cover a few of the changes that are uh, impacting on that front. But I think most importantly, like those two big changes of changing customers, changing technology, they're really making an impact on customer expectations. So we'll talk a little bit about what those are and then really dig in and lean in on what are some of the tactics to meet some of those expectations. So with that, Aaron, if you wanna to switch to the next slide for me. I think it's no surprise that we're already seeing millennials storming the car market. So by 2019, uh, millennials had already surpassed uh, baby boomers as the nation's largest living adult generation. By 2020, their market share accounted for 32% of all new car sales. And now by 2021, nearly every vehicle segment has been dominated by millennials as that dominant purchasing force. Um, but what's really interesting about kind of the shift isn't so much, I think, the demographic and the facts itself. It's really what's unique about millennials and the generations quickly on their heels that are maturing too into purchasing power um, that sets them apart 
it really is a lot of the technology and the ways that millennials have grown up with interacting online that's really set them apart as kind of a really unique purchasing power within automotive. They really are often called the experience generation, um, mainly because of those rich experiences that millennials interact with um, all too often. Um, even to the point that you see that one stat kind of in the middle, 67% of new car and tenders surveyed of that millennial age suggested that buying a car online feels like a realistic option. Um, so more and more of that experience is being brought online, which is really interesting. Yeah, Ryan, we actually have one of our webinar regulars, Landon. Hello, shout out to Landon. Um, he's been having wonderful results by switching uh, two dealerships over to content marketing strategies as opposed to uh, some of those other marketing strategies that maybe are a little older. Um, plus, he says it conforms with FTC regulations, so it sounds like he's on top of it. Um, I can't say he's a millennial. I'm borderline. Connor is 100% a millennial, but <laughs> that's good to know. So some of our yep. dealers are already seeing success. Yeah, again, it's just what's really interesting is a lot of the technology that's iterating around kind of this buyer base has just rapidly expanded as well. So that kind of dovetails us into the next slide here. Um, is really thinking through like how consumers are interacting today more so than ever. Um, so, I mean, already like we've seen the evolution from text to photos being a dominant engaging force to now video being a huge superpower that more and more consumers are engaging with. And we'll share some stats around that here shortly to now these immersive experiences. Um, so it's really interesting kind of this evolution of technology that is also been happening coinciding with millennials kind of coming into purchasing power. Um, I'm often reminded of my own experience of like gaming systems of our household had a Nintendo, then a Super Nintendo, then the Nintendo 64, and then now all the way to a PlayStation 5 and these kind of Quest headsets that have these immersive experiences. But what's really interesting about each of those evolutions of the gaming systems or social media or any of these technologies is that with each leap, the expectations for experience have only increased. Um, so we're not really looking backwards at kind of going back to just text-only communication. The demand for more interactive experiences because of how rich these technologies are uh, has only continued to grow. Yeah, I cannot tell you the frustration my six-year-old feels when um, a video buffers or there's a lag in something and I'm thinking, buddy, this is amazing technology, but it's true, the expectation changes. So I'm glad we're covering this and these stats, these were really interesting to me. Yeah, so like with that changing demographic, with all that changing technology, that buffering example was really poignant because it's almost like the, the need for now, the need for real-time experiences has never been greater. Um, so it's really interesting as we look, do a lot of studies and see a lot of research across the space, this demand for experience has only continued to increase. Um, I really like this kind of center stat here on the screen. Customers surveyed said that the experience a company provides is as important as its products and services. Um, that's really powerful because in my own retail experience in automotive, I was like nurtured with the car is the star, the product is the most important thing, make sure that product is featured. And there's still a lot of truth to that. The right car in the right market will certainly retail. Um, but what's really interesting too is that there's now being like almost an added commodity of experience that's also being considered alongside that product. And if that experience isn't what the consumer wants, the likelihood of them engaging for that product may be diminished as a result. To the point that you see there, 88% of people really value that experience. That's a big leap in just two short years. So I think that kind of sets the stage for some of our conversation of, I mean, there's these big change moments happening around us. There's shifting demographics that have had more access to technology and interaction than they ever have in the past. And as a result, those expectations have certainly shifted to really focus more on experience. And I think it's really interesting, like as we start to ask ourselves, are we creating those moments of discovery as dealers? Are we starting to find ways to remove that friction from the process to make the, the overall automotive journey easier to navigate, easier to reach certain parts of that discovery, whether it's selling a car, servicing a car, financing a car, buying a car? 
um, removing that friction has never been more important. So let's start kind of thinking through like tactically then, what does that mean for dealers? And this will be a really good segue into some of the specifics that Synchro has to share about what dealers are doing today to hit some of these. Um, but just quickly running through some of these stats, I think it's really interesting. 64% of people want easy access to more detailed product information. Well, what does that mean? Like that's easily translated into automotive inventory ads which what most dealers are supporting today is oftentimes their main strategy, if not their only strategy, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Uh, but it's really interesting that automotive inventory ads already start to address some of those pain points or preferences that today's consumer are looking for. Another stat here, 41% want an immersive experience that replicates that in-store experience. Um, again, that's really interesting when we think about what are the ways that we can help better support that desire from consumers. So thinking about digital retailing opportunities, are you presenting options for customers to start evaluating their vehicle trade um, earlier on in the process or scheduling service and thinking about kind of your brand and opportunities there? Um, so profit center campaigns, there's a lot of different tools that we'll talk through and how you can support that with Meta and some of the agency partners as well. 60% of consumers expect a great customer support experience. This is one that I'm really passionate about. I think it's incredible, this explosion of messaging that's happened in the space. Messaging being chat, text, SMS, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger. Um, and it's really interesting. We have so many more stats and research done on this space in particular, even to the point that we're seeing that consumers often will not even engage with a business unless there is a chat partner or chat solution um, that they can interact with. So. Messaging is a really big one, and we have a number of, of ways that you can support bridging that for automotive as well with Meta products. Yeah, it's me. Hi, I'm the problem. It's me. Um, that's topical, by the way. Um, but I want that live chat. I don't want to talk to a human. I talk to enough humans all day. If it's not on there, I will typically leave. Uh, so Messenger is huge. I know we've got a lot of dealers who have that on their site as well. So. Yeah, but that one, it's, it's just certainly exploded as utilization and that same sentiment, like well beyond the pandemic, like the peak of the pandemic when messaging really started to take hold in our industry, um, it's not gone away. It's only continued to increase in utilization. So, yeah. Um, and then lastly here, 48% of consumers want brands to uh, want to find brands that they haven't heard about before that align with some of their shopping preferences. So this goes back to some of those shifts with uh, what we saw with the, the millennial demographic coming into purchase power, those expectations of experience have only increased. Um, it's really interesting that store branding has never been more important, being able to differentiate yourself because I go back to that one stat of 88% of people are starting to value an experience as much as the product. Well, we need to be asking ourselves, how are we getting our brand, our store experience further online to be able to be accessible to our customers. So we'll have some strategies and some considerations there as well here as we talk. Um, but with that, unless there's any other questions, Aaron, that you're seeing or anything from our team, um, I'll dovetail here to Connor to start digging into some of the specific tactics that we're seeing dealers hit to meet some of these automotive shopper preferences. Yeah, we'll let Connor take it. I got a question on video. I'm going to save, I think. I know we've got some stuff on video coming up. But yeah, stay close, Ryan. I can't promise you we won't have more. But I mentioned Connor. Connor helps our dealers every day, works on social strategies. Um, he's cooler than I am, that's for sure. So talk to us a little bit about that customer journey. You know, Ryan set the stage with what customers expect, but how are they shopping online? What are they looking for? A hundred percent. So yeah, I'm having these conversations with dealers on a regular basis um, and really trying to push exactly what Ryan said for more of that full social experience instead of really that the one that I think that most of you guys focus on and most of automotive in general is really intent to purchase. So when we're talking about a full consumer journey on Facebook from start to finish, the easiest way to put it is really just the awareness phase where it's sort of that discovery. Um, they're learning about the brand. And we're really just keeping you top of mind, especially for the people that haven't exactly looked for that exact vehicle they want yet. Again, people aren't going on Facebook um, knowing, like, expecting a car shopping experience. That For that, they would probably be going to dealers' websites or other, um, really other resources. So 
understanding that really starting off with just a discovery and letting them know that you are active um, on social, they're getting familiar with the brand, and then moving them down the funnel from there to really that intent to purchase, which is um, really showing those, those VINs that that shopper might be interested in. So this really kind of highlights the ad that you guys are seeing on the right, which is a standard AIA ad that we went over. This ad type's amazing for Facebook because as we know, it will show the most relevant VIN that each shopper is most likely to select. So of course, if they were looking at Chevrolet Silverados around $50,000, uh, Meta is gonna do a pretty dang good job of making sure that VIN is showing up on their, their feed to make sure that they are getting engagement with it. But that really is a, even probably less today than it was then, it's a pretty small part of the entire buying process. So moving on from there, it's also important to know that there really is that last step too of really just building that brand loyalty. So building that relationship and building that trust with the shoppers who have already purchased or engaged with the brand. Because that also is another target market that a lot of us um, are not utilizing on social right now. Because like I said, it is a very middle heavy market right now. Um, this is kind of where us and Facebook are stepping into kind of trying to change that. So. Yeah, Connor, this is one of the key takeaways, I think, that probably a lot of dealers are calling themselves out right now, saying, yep, I'm right there in that middle. I want the leads. I want I want people to call me. I want those messages. Don't forget about that first step. And then your service customers and the fixed ops business. You know, last month we did our webinar on fixed ops, which is so important. So awareness and focusing on it and what to expect from the efforts that you're doing, not just on Meta, but across your social platforms. Yeah, so this one really just goes over all of the goals that, that Meta can help you guys meet. So um, I started off with lead driven because just looks like what Aaron was saying and it's the conversations that I am having um, day to day, week to week. Um, Facebook does do a great job of getting leads to your guys' CRM, to your salespeople, um, to your service department, whatever it might be based on the content that you're showing. Um, and while this is very important for conversions and of course to meet your guys' dealership goals, um, that really is a much, um, like I said, it's a small part of it all because what we're explaining is that it really is about the experience now. And honestly, just showing a VIN that they're interested in, popping up with a lead form saying, submit us your information, that really is not the most efficient or successful way to be driving those conversions anymore. So really understanding how, where, or where we're contacting our customers in their journey is really important. And they, uh, Meta does provide all of these different campaign types that you guys should be util utilizing outside of just these lead driven formats. So um, the other one that we've kind of touched over, which I am kind of pushing to all of my dealers as well, just because it is a method that a lot of people my age and the younger generation are preferring, is really like those messenger ads. Um, I think that there's two really big highlights to that, that dealerships should be utilizing. And one is I know a lot of shoppers are really are not going to be submitting a lead as their primary reach out to these dealerships. Um, a lot of them just aren't comfortable saying, here's my information to a salesperson, let me know more info. Um, there, it really is a lot more complicated than that. And the messenger campaigns do a great job of really just starting that conversation. So it is an immediate response where um, a salesperson or any media um, specialist on your guys' team at the dealership can be reaching out just to answer their questions and get them not only engaged with maybe a vehicle that they're interested in, but honestly just engage with the dealership in general to answer any questions they might have instead of just, again, just a quick lead form. Um, and then the other one is really just the engagement focus. And I think this is another one where we're really trying to stress the importance of this just because the users that are purchasing vehicles, the ones that are on social, um, they really are looking for, again, that experience, one that they can engage with, one that captures their attention outside of just showing that VIN. And I will say that the dealerships that I have that run video, um, usually the engagement, click-through rate, et cetera, um, performs very well, especially if you can keep those videos up to date. And not only that, just so you guys are aware, and we don't have a screenshot up, but you can even provide a video experience with your VINs underneath to still get leads. So you can combine a lead driven with an engagement driven ad type. Um, and honestly, I think that's the perfect way to kind of combine them to create sort of this, um, this perfect shopping experience on social. So really just understanding that there are other goals that we should be trying to reach outside of leads. And I know coming from a sales department, you guys probably are not hearing that too much. So. 
Yeah, it's interesting. Video, that was the question. So Ryan, I'm going to I'm gonna put you on the spot because I don't know if you've got this stat, but is video watch time still dramatically dropping off at about 15 seconds or has that kind of extended a little bit, you know, through the pandemic? Yeah, it's certainly, it's extended. So there's, there's definitely audiences that prefer that short form just for quick kind of touch points, but we are seeing longer form videos. In fact, even like reels has now been extended to be able to support longer form video experiences um, because sometimes there's more of a story to tell. So we are seeing that dwell time vary. Um, which is really interesting on the video front. Yeah, I was going to say real. I'll watch a 15 second reel, but I'll also watch a three minute one if it's super captivating, I suppose. But no, good stuff, Connor. I, I love this stuff. Here's my question. Connor, you're biased, so I'm not going to pose this one to you. But how easy is all of this? for a, the average dealer to do it themselves? Because I'm a big fan of, hey, let's teach you how to do it. But this is a lot to do all of these different ki kinds of messaging. So Ryan, I'm gonna start with you. Or, and Connor, I'll give you a shot too. But can dealers do this themselves? Yep, so I think at the highest level, all of these capabilities are accessible within Facebook Business Manager and our ad solution. So any dealer, any business can support a lot of these solutions. But I will qualify, they can get more complicated depending on how deep you wanna go integrating with your process and your inventory. So our examples might be automotive catalogs, being able to create those dynamic catalogs to build your inventory and be able to advertise against your inventory. Um, I know that Synchro provides some solutions to support that, but that can be complicated kind of self-service. Um, unless you're manually updating inventory, which can be difficult, especially as quickly as prices change and some of the other attributes of those inventory items change. Um, and then also as you kind of further scale out and think about some of these other strategies, like messaging is another good example. You can have all of these conversations within Facebook Messenger, but some stores prefer to also get some of that information captured to um, their CRM, or maybe you're using a managed service with a chat partner. Um, so being able to connect to your preferred messaging partner to be able to field those conversations in one place. Um, sometimes there's some more complexity there. Uh, but again, it just depends on how deep you wanna go. If you wanna be able yeah. to just self-service and, and be able to promote your brand and your and uh, conversations around your brand, certainly have the capabilities to do that self-service fairly easily. Um, right. But then the deeper you get into some of the various profit centers that you might support, there may be some partner support that you may need. Yeah, Connor, but I'm sure you work with dealers who tried this themselves yep. first. And oh, what's the experience? Overwhelming, too much, not enough time? Like, why do they then move to a managed service? Yeah, I would say most of them are not overwhelmed. Again, we are always pushing to run that full funnel strategy um, just because we know that it will drive better performance across the board. I think the more important part is just communicating the experience that we're giving their shoppers. So like, for example, if they are running messenger ads, which we do recommend, we want them to know how that user is interacting with their ad and what they, like the response time they should be expecting and just making sure that they are on top of all of the strategies we have running because high engagement from the dealer with specifically like messenger, um, but really any of these is just as important as actually running these ad types as well. So yeah. um, it definitely will take some more manpower and time, but I will say it's, it's fairly easy for the dealer, but like Ryan said, I think a partner does make a lot of these just a lot easier for a number of reasons. Sure, sure. All right, good stuff. Let's keep moving. So say say the word niche, say it. Niche, yeah, I think niche will All right. do it. All right, All um, right. perfect. What do you Yes, think? so kind of just bouncing off how uh, Meta provides all of these strategy types to meet your guys' goals. It's just important to know how they can also highlight um, and they make targeting for you guys as easy as possible to make sure you guys are getting the most efficient ad spend. So I am on dealer conversations all the time explaining that while I can give you guys recommendations on the, the best audience size and maybe the, the radius that I should be targeting from the dealership based on your guys' budget, I will say it's actually just as important to understand that with Meta's geo-targeting and the capabilities that you guys have for your guys' ads, I love having that conversation with dealers that really is like what area or what zips or whatever it might be 
actually can, has the most conversions with your dealership because I know some rural dealerships that have people that will travel a long ways and they actually have some favorite cities that are not in the radius that we would typically recommend. So not only that, so you guys know your market honestly better than any agency or anyone that's looking at your ads. Using that information for your targeting is, is crucial. And not only that, you can also use that info because like you guys know your audience and who's purchasing your vehicles, you also know your competitors better than anyone else. So for example, if you know a competitor's area, you really should be making sure that you're making effort to make not only your vehicles get shown, but I really think this is a great opportunity when we're talking about branding here to make sure that your brand is top of mind. And that's where like the awareness and all of the other um, campaign types that we've kind of been talking really do stand out. Um, so really just understanding how these shoppers are seeing your VINs and where they're seeing your VINs or your media or your ads um, is really just all part of that experience. And it's really on you guys to understand, again, like the, the strategies that you have running and how these people are communicating with you guys, submitting leads, et cetera. Um, and then lastly, this kind of just goes off everything that we've been speaking on. So I know a lot of you guys really are focusing on VIN level advertising. So you guys have a catalog with us or with Facebook or somebody else. Um, and you're really focusing on getting those leads and cost per lead is probably the most important uh, metric for you guys. That's a very specific market in, in Facebook. So like I said to you guys, we are showing the most relevant VINs to people who have shown interest in purchasing a vehicle. Um, when we only run that strategy, and I'm speaking um, from experience, most of my dealers are only running AIA or that VIN strategy we are missing out on really the whole other part of the journey, um, kind of like what I went over on the first slide where um, that broad audience of people maybe who have not showed a specific um, vehicle interest or they're not, um, they're not just locked into purchasing a vehicle in the next week. Um, you really are missing out on, on that entire market and that broad audience. And that is a lot of potential shoppers. So when you're not running some sort of awareness strategy or broad strategy, you're missing out on a lot of potential customers in the future. And um, communicating that with dealers, I know is tough sometimes, but I really hope that's one of the takeaways you guys can start to understand from all of this. And then lastly, um, just custom targeting. So making sure that once a, once a consumer, again, is active with you guys, maybe purchased a vehicle or did service, whatever it might be, making sure that we keep your brand, again, top of mind by showing, um, by reaching out and doing some retargeting with custom audiences or whatever it might be, but again, going past just that in-market audience and even going lower down the funnel to that retention strategy. So um, like I said, a lot of dealers are really only using part of the targeting that Meta offers um, and really just utilizing everything that it has to offer will honestly be better for the dealership and of course, um, bring in more, more profit, so. Yeah, no, that's great. Ryan, a question, uh, business pages, do they have all of the same they don't have the same capability as this personal page, but things like we talked about, like reels, uh, are there expected changes coming to that to sort of make some of this easier or differences? What do you think we'll see? Um, from a pages perspective, I think the biggest thing is we're going to continue to empower businesses to be able to engage with cus uh, their consumers. So a lot of big focus in on messaging, a lot of big focus in on being able to present content um, that's tied to catalogs as an example from a shopping uh, experience, it's integrated. Um, so that's gonna be some of the biggest areas of focus um, that we'll see here um, for business pages in particular. Um, yeah. I do wanna circle back if you don't mind on kind of to echo Please? what I'm sharing on like some of these diversification strategies because what's really interesting about kind of how our placement engine works when you run just an AIA campaign. Oftentimes we're targeting a very specific objective, somebody that's likely to view a VDP. And our machine learning is trying to find consumers that are likely to view a VDP, not necessarily consumers that are likely to message with you, not likely consumers that are likely to submit a lead. So even when you think about diversification, you don't necessarily have to think about different profit centers. It could still be inventory focused, but diversifying to have an automotive inventory ad focusing in on VDPs, but also a messaging ad to focus in on maybe talking about a new model that's dropping, or maybe it's um, trying to get pre-orders for specific vehicles where inventory is tighter. Oftentimes that's optimizing for something very unique a lead or a message in that case. 
So we actually get more reach potential out of our placements because you're diversifying the very specific things that you're trying to target. So it's a little technical, but it's point. really interesting, the placement engine that it, it's really trying to optimize for very specific things. And by thinking about how you diversify to broaden what you're targeting, you end up reaching more people and being able to engage with more in-market consumers as a result. We have tons of studies that start to suggest that with real data as well. Yeah, and that's why we're here, to engage with more customers. And speaking of studies, because Connor, the proof's gotta be in the pudding. So when you are tying you know, the brand awareness and that in-funnel, all the things you've talked about, we've seen good, good results in the past. So talk through this case study. Yeah, I think I think Ryan made this transition as easy as possible for me because that's exactly what we did with a, a fairly large dealer group um, that was running social with Synchro. So originally when they had signed up, um, like most dealers, they were heavily focused on leads. So we ran standard only AIA strategies. So we were taking them either to the website or to a lead form. And while we drove a, a lot of leads, um, we had a great cost per lead. Really what it came down to was the dealer group came back to us and they said, you know what, like we understand you guys are getting us the amount of leads we want, but um, they're not the quality that we're looking for um, and this just isn't gonna cut it. So what we did, well, we said, well, we understand that, but you guys are only running a small portion of what we would recommend for a full social strategy. So um, really aligning with their goals, which honestly was um, really just more sales, which I'm sure a lot of your guys' goals are. Uh, we did recommend exactly what we've kind of been going over was, why don't we actually do this full funnel strategy to hit a much larger number of shoppers instead of just going for that very, very specific goal of getting to the right VDP. Um, so what we did outside of AIA is we actually launched a video style campaign there that you can see at the bottom. We ran a completely just brand awareness, um, letting them know the dealership's values um, to keep them again, top of mind in that area and just um, to let them know that they care um, and that they're trusted. We kept their AIA strategy as well, um, because we do understand that's still in a very important part of what fit or what Meta can offer on uh, on social. But we also added a retention strategy. So what that retention strategy was with Synchro was, we actually integrated with their DMS to target um, likely rebuyers, um, shoppers who have had their new cars hit over a certain mileage and lookalike audience. So we actually built an audience that was similar to the shoppers who had already purchased with the brand to really hit, so not only the um, discovery um, and high funnel, the middle funnel with the intent to purchase, but also that really lower funnel using their DMS data. And when we combined all of these things together, like the results were incredible. So we pretty much saw in all KPIs, we saw improvements, including cost per VDP. We actually, even though we took away budget from the lead gen strategy, we actually had a lower cost per lead as well. So it really did a great job of Pushing, pushing those shoppers through the entire brand experience, which, which we know and we can prove um, provides more success for you guys. So on the next slide, I'll kind of go over what we saw um, and kind of just the details of what we did for this dealer group. So um, we can see their media spend and we ran this for about two months. So like I said, they had their AIA strategy, which was just lead driven um, and they weren't seeing the results. So again, we added video, which we know is very effective right now. Um, a strictly branded carousel, which there's a lot of ways you guys could do that, but we recommended just doing a branded carousel for them. And of course that retention DMS strategy. So with all of those done, um, we actually, the, the results were awesome. So we actually were able to convert on a lot more sales with that DMS integration. Um, we were actually able to um, do sales attribution. So when we do this integration through Synchro, we're able to actually attribute sales based on impression, click, and lead. And what's awesome about this strategy is we actually did get sales based on all of those. So we really were hitting the right shoppers based on where they were in the consumer journey. Um, and as you can see, their cost per sale was well under the average. So everything they were doing was perfect. Um, I think the next one, and then this is really the part that I like to highlight from this study. Um, and this is this was really interesting for them and just provided a lot of insight to this dealer group is with all of the strategies we had running, not only were we able to get more leads and more sales, every single strategy that we ran, um, including retention, um, the awareness, the ready to buy, everything actually had conversions to sales. So it's just understanding that when you actually um, provide 
the opportunity for your ads to hit these shoppers across their entire journey, um, you're a lot more likely to get conversions than when you're only targeting, again, that very, very specific goal. Um, and then the last stat is obviously it's a great success story for us in that dealership, but we were able to just do, again, based on the, the money they spent with us, um, the ad return, et cetera. Um, but the biggest win for us was just showing how, how much better this did than, again, just running that lead-driven strategy that I would say 70% of my dealers are doing right now. So really, really cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah, lots of detail there. Appreciate it. So, Ryan, a question from uh, Alicia. For Facebook ads, we've talked about it. Do you recommend uploading that customer list to create a lookalike audience? And I'm going to tag on how heavy of a list for the dealer is that? Yeah, so a lot of our kind of placement engine is looking for a lot of those in-market signals to begin with. So from a vehicle perspective, a lot of those signals are already being captured and we're optimizing for that placement to get in front of as many in-market consumers as possible. But there's some really interesting ways that you could consider strategies around using your own database. So like a really good example that I always like is from a service perspective, let's say you have a really massive service database and you've been in, in business for a while. Um, being able to upload customers that haven't been in service in the past 12 months is kind of that lost service customer opportunity and focusing in on that, that's a very specific target market. There's a few things that that might help drive. Number one is that loyalty and retention and getting those customers back in, but also thinking about the needs that dealers have around used cars. Those are prospects to acquire their vehicle, hopefully turn them into another vehicle um, because it's a customer that you already know. Um, so there's some really interesting ways that you can weaponize your database specifically um, to really go after that right target consumer. Yeah, no, I totally agree. First party data, we're going to keep talking about it. It's not going away as we move towards cookie-less future. Um, Connor, this one's tricky. I suspect you're not going to be able to answer it because it's case by case, but is there a recommendation on budget proposal for why buy here, ready to buy, retention? Is that really dependent on what the dealer's trying to accomplish and what they have to work with? It really is. I will say, I think, um, any budget going to buy buy is always going to be um, very efficient though, just because when you're doing again, those, those branded ads, you are going to get a lot more impressions and just eyes on it in general. So I understand I might not have an exact budget recommendation, but just you will get a lot more eyes again on your brand um, for a lot less budget than those other strategies. So that's just something to keep in mind, but it really is dependent on the dealership, their market area, et cetera. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, and any any vendor, any third party, you know, vendor that you're working with on this should work with you on that budget. I think that's the biggest takeaway I would say to be is make sure that they're proposing something to you that it fits with, you know, some of the slides you saw earlier, what you're trying to accomplish and that you're getting regular reporting and that they're meeting the expectation that they set. You know, I always shout out what questions should you be answering or asking your vendors. And those are things they'll come to you with that budget recommendation. Um, it's a critical piece. So I see some more questions. I'm going to save some of those um, because I want to jump into the metaverse. So does this mean I need to get the, Oc the Oculus? Is that what it's called? And we'll see. I mean, they're good for the reels of people running into <laughs> walls um, yeah. when they yeah, don't know what's going really on. Jump into our Quest headsets. Um, previously <laughs> Oculus, formerly Oculus. It's another oh. cool that we need to, to, to be put in. I'm like, not. I barely knew Oculus. I was so proud of myself. I just know it's the big goggle. So yep. here's, before you go, here's my thing that I want you to cover is, okay, how far into the metaverse and do we need the goggles in the dealership now? Like, I'm so excited to hear what's coming, but I want yep. you to like ground us. As Without well. a doubt. What should we be focused yeah, on? What's really interesting is that there's just, I mean, so much technology. I actually have one right here. This is the new Meta Pro, um, MetaQuest Pro. So much technology is packed in these headsets, and there's this this really rich, immersive experience that Meta is really putting a big bet on as an organization, even having changed our name late last year to Meta from Facebook, to demonstrate kind of this passion and this focus for building platforms, enabling connectivity across devices, and supporting the creators and partners that are really trying to bridge these new ways of communicating and experiencing. And where that is certainly a huge endeavor um, that's never before been really done to the extent that we're really pioneering as an organization. 
Um, there's some really interesting ways in which it's becoming more tactical and available to automotive specifically. Um, the first of which is the OEMs are certainly gravitating towards it as a means of building up and, and generating more brand awareness and engagement with their buyer base. I think one of the, my favorite examples is Mini launched what they call the Miniverse, which is a virtual reality experience that is very mini as far as the brand, where you can not only customize your driver and customize your vehicle, but even defy gravity and drive a Mini Cooper up a wall and through kind of this really interactive course. So the sky's the limit as far as what those virtual experiences might look like. And clearly there's a lot of cost prohibitive challenges there in building the creative and the ecosystems to support it, which is why the manufacturers really are taking kind of the first path there in automotive. Um, but what's really interesting is that we're also starting to bridge other ways to have these kind of rich experiences with our common 2D devices. So our phones and our other, like our desktop computers, where augmented reality is quickly becoming far more mainstream and accessible. Um, you may already have used augmented reality with Reels, filters, Snapchat, TikTok, you name it. There's a lot of different ways that that's becoming more prevalent in day-to-day -day life. But within automotive specifically, Meta has an ad unit for augmented reality. So you may have been in the past shopping for a couch or a sofa and been able to see that sofa in your living room, feel the color, feel the size, feel the shape before you purchase. Similarly, manufacturers and even some of our tier two agencies are starting to explore augmented reality to put a vehicle in your driveway or in your garage to see if it fits with kind of real scale. Um, so we're seeing more and more engagement, even to the point where some dealers have been very creative to really more build their brand than really support transactions by, by completing some transactions in the metaverse. Um, but it's not something that's gonna be mainstream every day that every dealer and every customer is gonna have a headset on navigating these experiences. And that's why we're doing a lot of work and a lot of focus on bridging some of that 3D experience with the 2D world that we live in with our phones, our, our computers, et cetera. So more to come here. It's definitely a horizontal opportunity, not necessarily something that every dealer needs to be jumping in on today, but there's yeah. a lot of focus of our manufacturers in particular of really starting to innovate and iterate with some of these newer emerging tools for that same mission of driving that engagement. Yeah, and I, that was the conversation in the chat that uh, tier one, lots of opportunity. Shout out to yeah. many for what you've accomplished there. And I know we'll see more and it only benefits us at tier three. Um, I see everybody's questions. I'm holding them till the end. Don't worry, I'm not ignoring you. Um, but AI is a little bit creepy, um, but in a good way, in a beneficial way. Yeah. Um, but video, I don't know what this is, but uh, talk to us a little bit about, because we love video, so more on this. Yeah, so it's it's really interesting. Um, one of our big focus areas for bringing to market new products, new solutions, new ways to interact is on the video front. Um, already, you've seen reels start to become, um, or every video that is posted on Instagram is now a reel. That change is already in place, so that amplifies reels exposure significantly. But even before that, it's really interesting, some of these stats, like 50% of all engagement on Facebook is video. For me, that really kind of pulled me back a little bit of like, man, like half of everybody on Facebook right now is probably interacting with a video. Uh, so it really kind of tells you the power of that particular format. Um, and with our focus on AI and Reels in particular, what we're starting to do is not just find other placements where video can be more accessible on our platform. So you now see reels on Facebook, just like you see stories across Instagram and Facebook as well. But even some of the uh, discovery engines around what reels are presented to you, we're innovating and, and iterating on those as well. So video is certainly a huge focus. It's the largest contributor to growth across Instagram as far as engagement. 80% um, of all reels are viewed sound on, which is also an atypical kind of metric. In the past, I think it was most uh, was sound off and we encouraged captions, um, but now most are sound on um, so that more and more consumers are engaging with this content. So from an automotive perspective, it's really interesting though, because in the past, 
a lot of dealers really tried to have professionally created content and creative. You wanted to represent your brand in the right way. You had to have it sound off with captions. So that took a little bit of extra work. But with Reels, there is such a demand for authenticity, uh, a demand for having more kind of just content that looks and feels like the experience that, that you would have kind of there in person, um, which really opens up a world of possibility for dealerships to make it easier to help kind of produce that content. Because I know that's been a pain point is how do I support creative for some of these video platforms? Um, so things like being able to post maybe a walk around of a new vehicle that just hit your lot, or I've heard oftentimes teammate Tuesday featuring a sales associate or a service technician. Um, and just doing a quick interview of, Hey, what's your name? What's your favorite vehicle on brand at your dealership? And like, what's your favorite hangout spot in the local city that you're in? And those little anecdotes personalize and humanize. I think a lot of the content around your brand that really play into that demand for experience that we were talking about earlier. Um, so the the constraint of creative has been lessened actually with a lot of this focus on reels because anybody can really post now without it necessarily having to be this full fledged production. Yeah, no, good points. I will tell you, my parents um, aren't on Instagram and now they can see my stories of my kids because they push. So they thank you for that. Yeah. That I told you this earlier, that sound stat shocks me. Um, I think that's TikTok and Reels becoming more prevalent. I think that's what that is. But your notes on the creative are spot on. I remember when video walkarounds started to be a thing and your general manager would be like, well, your video was shaking. No, listen, you're a real person. You went out there. Okay. And, you know, the stuff that goes viral is just a, you know, 16-year-old kid in his basement. Like, it doesn't have to be you know, a full on production. So more on video, keep pushing on that. Uh, but messaging we've talked about a few times as super critical. So what's coming with these enhancements? This is cool stuff. Yep, so this is again, the, the one that excites me the most because I think just messaging has been such an explosion over the last several years as far as consumers utilizing it. And we saw that the demand for messaging, like if you don't message with your customers today or provide the ability that could even exclude you from being able to be considered at all. Uh, but what's really remarkable about automotive is how deep some of the messaging partners have got with some of the tools that dealers already use. So things like scheduling service, your trade appraisal tool, calculating payments on vehicles. Oftentimes dealers are using messaging partners that have already integrated with a lot of the tools that you may already be using in your dealership. Um, so we're being able, it gives us the ability to really interact with customers a lot more closely to all these different parts of that buying process. Um, so messaging is pretty cool as far as just the capabilities. Um, even if you're self-servicing and managing messaging, um, there's certainly so much more to be had of, of qualifying customers versus trying to proactively re-reach out to them from a lead. Um, but there's three enhancements that we're making to make this a little bit more accessible and easier on our side. The first one is what we call dynamic placement optimization. Really fancy word for us trying to simplify the process of being able to capture either a lead or a messaging chat opportunity. So in the past, previously you would need to create a lead ad campaign and or a messaging ad campaign to be able to generate leads or messages. This new dynamic placement optimization allows you to create a single lead campaign, but then our placement engine will decide whether or not the consumer is most likely to submit a lead or most likely to wanna to have a conversation. So instead of two campaigns, it's now just one campaign, which also helps meet the customer experience a little bit better based off of their likely preference. Um, right. So that's one innovation that we've, we've launched that's accessible to all dealers now across the country. Another one is what we call messaging to lead workflows. Another way that this is also referenced a lot in a lot of our documentation online is click to messaging lead gen. Again, another mouthful as far as a product name. Um, but again, this one's really interesting because typically when you would launch a lead ad in the past, well, what would happen is the customer would click the lead, it would auto populate some information, the customer would hit submit, and then it was over the lead was submitted and that was the, the end of the interaction. What we've done now is integrated, now is integrated that lead flow into the messaging experience. 
So when you create a lead ad now, you can now create a click to messaging lead ad that will pull that lead form almost like, think of it as a bot within a messaging window that will ask the customer the questions that you have in your lead. But then instead of just dropping that lead and ending the conversation, your managed service or you as the agent, as the dealer can then continue that conversation after you've captured that PII. So again, think of it as almost like a, a lead on steroids. Not only are you capturing the lead, but then you're continuing the conversation with the customer beyond that to improve the quality of that prospect. Um, that also is really cool because that gives you the, uh, the ability to templatize maybe an off the shelf approach for, hey, this is maybe my lead flow for servicing a customer. This is my lead flow for trying to do a vehicle evaluation to get some information about a trade. Um, or maybe for expressing interest in a, an upcoming event or vehicle um, the pre-order. So there's a lot of ways that you can weaponize that in particular. But again, it's about capturing the lead, but not just ending there, continuing the conversation so you can continue to talk to that customer. And the last uh, item here is more of a surprise and delight. It's click to call and messaging. So one of the things that we were also noticing is that when you run messaging campaigns, occasionally the customer may want to abandon having a conversation online. Maybe they want to talk to somebody in real time. Maybe it's oftentimes around service and the status of a vehicle as an example. Uh, and before what would happen is, well, the customer would have to just close the chat window and then find the phone number and call. Um, we're now making it far more accessible and visible to click to call within a messaging ad as well to, again, help address some of that possible abandonment, still connect that customer to the dealership directly. Uh, but all those uh, different strategies, all of them are available today within Business Manager and our ad solutions. Um, so they're accessible today to start experimenting and piloting. But I think we yeah. covered a lot of different tactics, a lot of different strategic items and some things that are happening on the roadmap. But I think to really round out kind of meta side of this conversation here, um, it's really all about experience. And this is a quote from Kim Stonehouse who leads uh, all of in, our head of industry for automotive at Meta. But just as auto marketers have differentiated on product for years, today's advantage lies in differentiating on experience. The brands and dealers winning more customers are the ones who remove friction to compete on car and convenience. So I think it's really powerful that you see all these shifts as we thought, as we heard about the demographics changing and that demographic exposure to changing technologies and this expectation that experience is now as valuable as the product itself. Dealers that really are thinking through how do we start to address some of the experience online and, and remove friction through messaging or other ways or branding to get uh, more of your value proposition in front of customers early has never been more important. Yeah, absolutely. Such good stuff. I hope you can hear me. My phone hung up on me, so my audio switched and I had a mild panic attack while you were talking, but I think I'm okay. Perfect. So Ryan, thank you. You're not off the hook. We've got more questions, I know, but changes are coming. Uh, lots of changes. January, I think, is the date. Um, so Connor, I'm going to have you talk a little bit about this, but before we do, Ryan, Give us like a, a elevator pitch of what is changing. Vehicle tabs yeah. are no more, correct? Yeah, so there's been a lot of questions around vehicle tabs, your ability to post to Facebook Marketplace as a business. And so previously, we had the ability to automate a lot of your inventory to Facebook Marketplace um, through your same catalog. And we sunset that capability and then made it a manual process to post inventory from your catalog or your page uh, to Facebook Marketplace. But effective January 30th, we are sunsetting that capability as well. Um, our Marketplace has traditionally been more of a peer-to-peer -peer type relationship uh, as far as being able to interact with individual-to-individual -individual selling. Um, so that capability will be going away to be able to post manually either to your vehicle tab or to Facebook Marketplace moving forward. So that, is, that date is January 30th. There are still ways okay. to post inventory on, on Marketplace. One is as an individual, 
which will defer to dealership's preference on whether or not you want individual people posting inventory, but it's not tied to a catalog. It's fully manual um, as one option. And then we do have sponsored listing placements through some of our ad sets that agency partners or, or DIY um, advertisers can support that also appear on Marketplace as well. Yes, no, awesome. And Connor, I know this is your slide, but I'm gonna take it in the interest of time. Um, but this is what you, this is what we help dealers with. So you can DIY that vehicle catalog is still available. Synchro is one of those uh, vendors who can help with that. But AIA ads work with a partner like Synchro, so I'll give you a shameless plug that yes, Rick asked in the chat, does Synchro have a standalone solution for a full funnel strategy? Yes, we do. And that is what Connor does all day is he helps dealers with this. So Synchro Social Suite, yes, we do VIN level advertising. You know, we connect with those hand raisers and all the things you've seen earlier as to make sure you're connecting with shoppers the way they want, when they want in that purchase timeframe. So ask me about this. I see a few of you already. I will make sure that we reach out to you. Uh, Social Suite is there, but Connor, take us through how we use first party data, because that was a conversation here. I'll ask you to move quick, but um, just give us a few highlights on this. Yeah, again, I'll, I'll try to be fast with this, but I um, like I said, this, is, this goes back to um, the OnStation data platform, which I told you that dealer group had integrated with us. Um, so we do offer that opportunity as part of one of our packages where we actually are able to use your DMS data, not only to retarget customers and hit that lowest funnel of people um, who have already engaged with your brand, which is automated too. So we don't have to manually upload lists or place those pixels or whatever it might be. We do do that in automation. But like I said before too, with this integration um, that we have with Facebook, we are actually able to attribute sales as well. So we can attribute any of our campaigns, um, sales via impression, click, or lead, which a lot of agencies are not able to do. So it's just, um, it provides a lot of insight to the dealers, and not only that, it does provide you, again, that targeting option that um, a lot of dealerships might not be hitting right now, so. Yeah, absolutely. Nobody does it better than us. Um, and that's me giving Connor a compliment. And I've been kind of mean to him this whole webinar. So that was nice. Uh, awesome. I do have questions. I'm going to see if we can get to them. I want to make sure you register for our November webinar. We're going to talk more social, but we're going to talk reputation management, which is always something that a few people have been asking for. So we're going to hit on that. But I wanted to make sure I gave everybody this info. Who's going to Dallas? for NADA in January, January this year. I am so excited what Synchro is doing. We are gonna be there. We have uh, taken out, I think like the entire main floor of the Crescent Club, don't quote me on that. But it's this really hip place in Dallas. It is so close to NADA. We are gonna be there, it's not on the slide. We're gonna be there with beverages, we've got food, we've got some workshops, we're gonna do a ton of things We'll show you our stuff. We'll show you our websites because they are the best, but meet our experts. I'm going to be there. We will have so many of our senior leaders. Um, the QR code, you can reserve some time. It's like the dentist. Pick a time on those four days. I'll call you in December and we'll make sure it still works for you. But that is a link when you download this deck there. You can sign up there, scan the QR code. Come see me in Dallas at the Crescent Club. I'm so excited. We've got all of our resources here, all our past webinars, all the recordings are available. This is in that deck. All right, we got one minute. We might go over because I do want to ask a few of these questions. So if you have to leave, nobody's mad at you. Um, Connor, is our synchro suite, uh, it, or excuse me, social suite, is that fully automated or can somebody, either the dealer or you, do we step in and work with the AI if needed? Yeah, we no, we definitely works working with them. So with our social suite solution, um, while we do have like a standard package, they will have a specialist um, before launch that goes over strategy and what we should have live again. Um, hopefully, focusing on that full experience instead of just that that kind of automation. So 100%, you will have someone at Synchro that works with you um, to answer questions and make sure that the ads that we need live are live. Awesome. Okay, uh, Ryan, a few questions on this, and I'm not gonna get the specifics, but there are sometimes challenges uploading ads, maybe things get denied or flagged, things like that. What's the best way for dealers to get in touch with Meta if they're doing it themselves? 
just to make sure that they're learning and doing things right. And yeah, we want our ads to show up. Any tips on that? Yeah, th so there is a chat option at our business resources on our uh, site for um, all of the kind of the business documentation for how to navigate our tools. Um, but we could probably share the link here after this call too of exactly where to go. Um, but it allows you to chat directly with what we call our meta support pros. And it opens tickets just like I would open a ticket on my side uh, to be able to navigate any sort of troubleshooting that you might have as far as ad accounts, pages, sometimes user access challenges, depending on um, what the flavor is that you're trying to troubleshoot. Yeah, no, and I know it's a lot and we see this across multiple platforms, not just Meta. So if you need help, my email webinar team at synchrodigital.com, reach out to me. I'll see what I can do, get you that contact info. And thank you, gentlemen, thank you. We're, it's 11.01, I went one minute over, but thank you both, appreciate it.